There's one sense in ultimate. Of course, that's what physics is after. In that you say, at a certain point, you say they're atoms. OK, now we found out more about them. They're protons and neutrons. Now we found out more about the protons. They can train quarks. So we're getting a more and more detailed, precise picture of the physical world. And you think, I mean, some people have speculated this goes on forever, which I have a hard time understanding. You think there will be an ultimate in the sense of, sense of an absolute bottom ground of this. It's not that the quarks are, you know, maybe the quarks are strings. You, you but can't it does, keep it doesn't going go back. on forever, right? That, that, you, that there ought to be some bottom. And the, the goal of physics is to find it and describe it clearly mathematically. That would be a kind of ultimate reality, which I think is the aim of physics. But if you ask me, Sorry, did your life change look, wait, I just, I just, meaning, wanna, I just right? want to understand yeah. that. So you're saying, ultimately, physics is try or it's, it's ultimately math. I mean, that's what we're getting at, the mathematical principles. Well, and, but you're trying to get down, I mean, uh, it, it turns out a proton is a complex thing. And so to really understand it, you have to understand it's made of other things and what they are and how they're put together and what they're made of. But that presumably bottoms out somewhere. And you can say where it bottoms out. That would be right. ultimate reality. But I don't think anybody's life changed on their day-to-day you know, basis when they found out that protons were made of quarks, right? I mean, we were getting closer to the bottom, but that didn't have significance and meaning of this other sense of ultimate reality with a big U that has this glow around it, right? I mean, I'm interested in the world. I just want to know what it's like. I'm just curious. I'm a nosy guy, right? <laughs> so I'm interested in physics because I think it's getting me closer and I'm trying to understand what physics might be telling us about the world. And I would like to get down to the bottom. I don't think we will, but I, you know, that, that would be the goal. I think there's something about um, ultimate that has a ring of completion mm -hmm. and of finality which um, is something that bothers me because I think um, by definition and by nature, um, by, by definitions, um, science and physics will never really be complete. I mean, I think that's a fundamental aspect. It's plastic. It will always be changing and we'll always be discovering new things and serendipitously or because we're looking for them. So I think my discomfort with sort of ultimate is this idea that there will be this sort of final frontier which will be conquered and then that's it. Wait, but there's, there's no, nothing more. There's another way to look at that. That right. maybe yes, science, physics will never explain all of that. It can it can never come up with a final theory, but there still is that deeper reality. In other words, we're 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 saying that Science can only take us so far. There are inherent limits on what science can explain about the deepest nature of reality. Right, but we can't really make predictions about what future science can and cannot discover today, right? Could Copernicus have uh, predicted that we'd have GPS on our phones today and that the <laughs> nature of gravity, like in a very fundamental way, general relativity would have taught us about uh, gravity? No. So I think we cannot make predictions about where future science will take us, can or cannot take us. But you, you made a prediction. You said it'll never end. <laughs> it enough. could, right? You could, they could come up, it could be the standard model. And you keep testing it, and it's all the standard model. And you know, if you worked out, I mean, there are other things to work out. But I don't see why you know beforehand you won't actually get down to a, to a final theory. That's what a lot of physicists are looking for. I, there's no guarantee you'll find it, but I can't see there's any guarantee you won't. But I think it's inherently a, a religious idea, actually. It's a religious <laughs> idea. I mean, I'm not saying that it gets, I'm saying the way it has been applied and the, the, the thing that calls us to it, right? Because it's quite possible that, yeah, there's, you know, there's some uh, set of players, um, you know, this, this is the argument against emergentism or reductionism, right? So maybe there's a bunch of players down there, but actually, you know, the emergence of life, nothing, you know, you can know everything about these players down here, and that's not really going to tell you about how life formed or the particular, you know, that there's emergence of things that comes out later. So therefore, the ultimate reality that you were hoping for really only told you so much. But I think in the Western tradition in particular, there's been a way in which this, the, the attractiveness of the ultimate reality mm -hmm. was in some sense linked to the fact of the way Western, you know, the way science, not just Western science, this is science, how science emerged out of this both philosophical and religious, particularly a monotheistic tradition where this ultimate reality was God, was the mind of God. And that's, you know, I know I was drawn to physics as a young man. I wasn't religious, but there was still that sense of, I will know 
the ultimate. And I think that may be something that we have to shift around with, both for philosophical reasons or also because that's actually sort of what we're learning about the world, that we're not going to get that kind of ultimate. Dave, you wanted to jump Well, in? no, I, again, I think it's a perfect, uh, I, again, I'm going to strongly agree, I think. This is a very boring panel. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get into more <laughs> He's a philosopher. But, but I agree with you, disagree with, with everything. No, anyway. um, <laughs> but it just, maybe there's another way of fra rephrasing, I think, what, what both um, what I'm hearing from at least Priya and uh, Adam, if not from two, uh, is this, this relatively recent turn, the last, say, four decades, not four centuries, uh, within certain branches of physics to focus on um, um, effective descriptions that describe everything we could possibly want to know for a given set of circumstances. That usually means of energy scales. How energetic are the things you're trying to describe? And that means that it actually literally doesn't matter that we do not know the ultimate either sort of above or below at different scales. Uh, and so in that sense, I can imagine an infinite tower um, of the sort that Priya mentioned that it could just go on forever. And that wouldn't stop us from, uh, that wouldn't make the knowledge we have today less secure. It also uh, very, very strongly picks up the point of this um, non-reductive, the, the Yep. The challenge to reductivism is that even if there were one set of marbles out of which the, everything came, uh, we would we would very likely be powerless to make any statement about anything other than that scale of marbleness. And so that doesn't sound like a very you know meaningful or deep or satisfying description. That wouldn't help us describe how that clock works or indeed how our own universe works in in a large scale. So this notion, which is not so old, it doesn't go back to Copernicus. It goes back to sort of the early 1970s, at least in its modern form, uh, is that we have uh, we have we have a way to know the limits that we need to describe what we're after right now. And that's already really hard, but really good. It has a kind of self-limiting character to it. So the talk of uh, the physicists want one ultimate theory, I, don't, I think a lot of physicists want a really robust, effective theory for that set of phenomena mm -hmm. that might or might not lead to clues for what might or might not be asked for the, for the next level. That's, right. that's really good. That's good enough for me. I don't. It, well, I mean, yeah, so this is, you see, I don't actually do this stuff, so I can just ask for whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, but, it's on but, order. But, but let me at least say, I, I mean, I, I, I think there is a, a, a unique ultimate story about this, but it has nothing to do with monotheism or religion at all. So people say, okay, we've got a pretty good theory. Let me take your effective thing. We've got a yep. pretty good theory of quantum mechanics that works for these systems mm -hmm. at these mm -hmm. scales and yes. blah, blah, blah. We have general relativity that works really well for gravity for these systems mm -hmm. at these other scales. What in the world makes you think there ought to be a single theory from which both of these, as it were, follow? So a single unified theory. It's not because I believe in God. It's because I believe in the sun, right? And I think the sun is a strongly gravitational system and, and, and at the same time a strongly quantum mechanical system. So nature has figured out some way or other to, you know, to have a single physics that gives rise to both of those things. It's not, it's not you know, this religious, like, whatever. Right. It's, there's a world out there. I'm trying to figure out how it works. It does work, right? And, I mean, and, and, thank, and thank goodness, our effective description for which we don't have a theory of yeah. quantum gravity actually works beautifully for the sun, for the right. galaxy, and for clusters of galaxies. Right. Right. Thank goodness. Right. It's, a, be really it's, a, it's an interesting <laughs> observation that, that yeah. there can be these kind of self-contained right. domains, yeah. which within certain scales, you can write down effective laws that right. are very good. And, that, and right. it, for which we can calculate to 15 you know, yeah, yeah. decimal right. places. But you know, there's a very yeah. simple way in which um, I was saying something which was really simple about seeing why um, the frontier could be shifting, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, as time goes on, more and more of the universe becomes observable and visible to us. And it's unclear that the phenomenology that that's going to provide um, that we have all the frameworks to explain it. We don't know that yet. So in my view, that's sort of where I come from when I say, well, it could be, um, mm -hmm. you know, the frontier could always be shifting. Yes. Because yeah. it's unclear whether in 500 years, 5,000 years, as more of the universe, the early universe, yeah. comes into view, that our current theories of galaxy formation, the effective theories that work mm -hmm. now, may be rendered inapplicable yes. Uh, or may require um, serious, they may, they may require augmentation, alteration, or completely be destroyed, and we may have to start, start off from that.